Good evening. Welcome to our first class on the prophetic gates of Jerusalem. Uh, this will be an eight-week series, and we're going to be studying these 12 gates that are in the walls of Jerusalem, and they have great uh, prophetic importance. They hold great prophetic importance to us. And if you notice on your note sheets, we trust you have a, a copy of the note sheets before you. On the very first page, we find that Nehemiah lists the 12 gates in almost, not quite, but almost the exact order. And uh, he goes around the walls of Jerusalem in a counterclockwise manner. So um, uh, of these 12 gates, 10 of them are found in Nehemiah chapter 3. There's the sheep gate, the fish gate, the old gate, then there's the valley gate, the dung gate, the fountain gate, the water gate, the horse gate, the east gate, which is known as the golden gate. And that's the, um, uh, then the, the next one is what is called the Mitkad gate, which is more commonly known as the corner gate. And those are all listed in Nehemiah chapter 3. In chapter 8, he lists another gate, which is the Ephraim gate. And in, num in uh, Nehemiah chapter 12, he lists another one, which is the prison gate. Now on the next sheet in your uh, notes, we have a map here, or a chart if you please, of where these gates are located. The location of these gates are all very, very important as you will see shortly. Now, just one word about this uh, map. Here's uh, the city of Jerusalem, the darker part here, and around it, way out here, is this other wall. That did not exist in biblical times. That wall was not there. That wall was built probably uh, parts of it by the Crusaders and parts of it by the Turks, uh, the Ottoman Empire. But this inner wall is the one we're interested in. Those were the 12 gates that existed in biblical times. That's what we're interested in. And if you notice across the top there, the north wall, you have three gates. You have the sheep gate, the fish gate, and the old gate. This is going counterclockwise. Then on the eastern wall, you have the prison gate, the Ephraim gate, the valley gate, and the dung gate. You look down at the south wall, and there are no gates at the south wall. But then over on the eastern wall, you have, starting at the bottom and coming up, the fountain gate, the water gate, the horse gate, the east gate, which is more commonly known as the golden gate, and the mipcad, or corner gate. And so those are the 12 gates of Jerusalem. The exact order in which they appear in the wall of Jerusalem is of prophetic importance. So we're going to begin by looking at the gospel in the gates. Now before we study the gates, it's imperative that we study the walls because the gates are in the walls. And when Babylon destroyed the walls, they destroyed the, most of the gates along with it. And so Nehemiah is commissioned to go back to Jerusalem by king, uh, the king of um, Persia there, uh, Artaxes, and he is commissioned to go back and to rebuild the walls, and of course that includes the gates as well. Now, not all of the gates in the wall around Jerusalem today are these same gates. Remember the big outer wall around there, and there's other gates now, but we're focusing on the, the gates during the biblical era. These were the gates that were there, and these are the ones that have a prophetic message for us. Well, let's consider the walls. First of all, you have the northern wall. That's where the first three gates are located. And the northern wall speaks to us of salvation. You can see on your map there, those gates in that northern wall have to do with salvation, the sheep gate, fish gate, and old gate. Then we're going around counterclockwise, the western wall. The western wall, it has four gates, and they all speak of damnation. Everything about those gates on that western wall have some connection to evil. And um, we'll see that when we come to it. Then we come to the southern wall, and the southern wall speaks to us of separation. 
because there's no gates on the, on the southern wall at all. Then coming around, still in the counterclockwise manner, the bottom of the eastern wall, we have two gates. We have um, uh, the, um, uh, the two gates uh, there in the lower part that speak to us of inspiration. And then the upper part of the wall, coronation, the coronation of the Lord Jesus Christ. These 12 gates in their exact order give us a prophetic picture of God's prophetic plan for the ages. So we're going to start out now tonight with the northern wall. We won't get to the gates till next week, but the northern wall. And the northern wall, you remember, we said equals or speaks of salvation. Okay? And why the northern wall? Well, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but... According to the Word of God, heaven has a geographical location. And that geographical location is to the north. And so it is significant that the northern wall, the gates that are in the northern wall, all have to do with salvation. If heaven is symbolized here as to the north, then these uh, gates are how you get to heaven. And we'll see that starting next week. Okay, so uh, let's, let's first of all look at this northern wall. In Job chapter 26 and verse 7, Job says, or this is actually he's talking about God here, it says, He stretcheth out the north over the empty place, and he hangeth the earth upon nothing. Well, it, the last part of that verse is, is uh, scientifically significant because it was a long time before science realized that the earth is out there in space hanging on nothing. But we want to focus on the first half of that verse. He stretcheth out the north over the empty place. What is the north? Well, the north here is a reference to heaven, and we have it a number of times in the Word of God. And as we study the sky, the, the stars, the galaxies, uh, it, there is this beyond number. In fact, in Jeremiah chapter 32, it says that the, the host of heaven cannot be numbered. They're just, they're just packed in with the density of the grains of sand on the seashore. However, there's one spot in which it is empty of stars, and that is located to the north. It's up in the area of the constellation Cygnus, which is known as the Swan. And right up there to the north is this vast empty space. This is the geographical location of heaven. Now this empty space has been observed by astronomers. And um, if you go to the next two pages, we're going to come back to this page, but if you look at the next two pages, here's a, a quotation about this from John Zoller. He's a uh, He's dead now, but he was the radio pastor for many years in this area. And he wrote a book called Heaven. And here's what he tells us about that uh, empty space. It says, modern astronomers tell us that there is a place in the north in the constellation of the swan where there is a rift in the heavens, a place where there are no stars. It is a matter of photographic record that this is true. The great telescopes of Yerkes Observatory, located in Williams Bay, Wisconsin, and at Mount Palomar in California, have taken photographs of this rift, showing us that there is such an empty place that Job told us existed. We have a more uh, recent uh, quotation about that, and this comes from, uh, well, actually we got it from Answers in Genesis, but it's quoting the Astrophysical Journal. This was back in, in uh, September of 2007. It states that the U.S. National Radio Astronomy Observatory uh, Sky Survey is a collection of 27 radio telescopes in New Mexico, the, and it tells us that this void or this empty space is almost a billion light years across. So there is a vast empty space in the sky to the north. And we're going to see from the scripture, this is the location of heaven. So Job says he stretches out the north over the empty place. Okay, now the next verse we're going to look at is Psalm 48.2. It says beautiful for situation, and that word situation means literally elevation. 
a beautiful elevation. That's what heaven is. It's a beautiful elevation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north. And that word sides means a far away place. It's a be heaven is a beautiful elevation in a far away place, the uttermost parts of the north. Now, if you'll turn in your Bibles, please, to the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews, I want to show you, re read a little bit uh, uh, to you about that. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to read um, starting with verse 22. He says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion. Now, that's not the earthly Mount Zion, Jerusalem. This is the heavenly Jerusalem, the heavenly Mount Zion. He says, Ye are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. And he tells us what we're going to see when we get to heaven. You ever wondered about that? What you're going to see in heaven? It says, We are come to an innumerable company of angels. And then going on to verse 23, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. And then finally, verse 24, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Those are all the things that we see as we enter into heaven. And it's located there to the north. It's the beautiful elevation in the faraway places of the north. Then we have a third reference. And that's in Isaiah chapter 14. And this is about Satan. Satan's fall. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? You see... When Satan fell, he was on earth. He wasn't up in heaven. He was on earth. But he wanted to go up to heaven. And, and you read it here. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground? See, that's earth. That word ground means earth, land, soil, okay? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? There's no nations up there. Nations are down here, all right? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. There you have it. Lucifer was on earth. He was the prince of this world. And he says, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne. That's his earthly throne. Jesus called him the prince of this world. I will exalt my throne. Notice, above the stars of God. He's referring here to that empty place. To above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation here it is, in the sides of the north. Same thing as in Psalm 48 too, the far away places of the north. This is where God is located. This is where heaven is located. And so again, the scripture refers to it as from the north. In the first chapter of Ezekiel, when Ezekiel is given the revelation of the cherubim, cherubims coming to him. In Ezekiel 1 verse 4, the Bible says, I saw a whirlwind coming out of the north. It says they, they were coming from heaven. It says it came out of the north. And notice Psalm 75 verse 6. It says promotion. And that word promotion means to be high and to rise up. It says promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. So where does it come from then? Obviously it comes from the north. So the gates in the north wall here, the, the north wall speaks of heaven. That's the location of heaven. And the gates in the north wall point us to heaven. The sheep gate, the fish gate, and the old gate, which we'll see starting next week. Then secondly, we have the western wall. And the western wall speaks to us of damnation. As we said, all four gates on the western wall are, have an evil connotation connected with them. There is the prison gate, the Ephraim gate, the valley gate, and the dung gate. And most of us uh, have, would be somewhat familiar with that valley gate because the valley there is in the Old Testament called the Valley of Hinnom. And in the New Testament, Jesus referred to it as by its Greek name, Gehenna. 
And this is what he used to describe hell, Gehenna, where the fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not. This is where all the refuse of the city was taken out and burned, a continual burning fire. So it speaks to us of hell. So this western wall is uh, a damnation. And then finally on that wall there is the dung gate. All the filth of the city is taken out of that gate and, and dumped out there. So uh, the western wall, just as the northern wall is salvation, the western wall is Damnation. Now, symbolically in the Bible, going east is always symbolic of going away from God. And by the same token, going west is always symbolic of going towards God. Now, going to the next page, next uh, page of notes after the, uh, those two articles there, uh, we're going to consider here going east, going away from God. Now, this is a theme that runs through the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. Genesis 3.24, when man fell, what does it say? He drove, uh, he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims with a flaming sword so that man couldn't come back into the Garden of Eden. Why did he place these flaming cherubims at the east of the Garden of Eden? Obviously because when man left the Garden of Eden, he went to the east. He was going away from God. In Genesis 4.16, Cain kills Abel. And it says he went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod. Where was it? On the east of Eden. He goes even farther east. Notice he went out from the presence of the Lord. He's going away from God. And then in Genesis chapter 13, verse 11 and 12, it says Lot chose him all the plains of Jordan and Lot journeyed east. He was going away from God, and if you look at the end of the passage, he pitched his tent towards Sodom. How did Lot get into Sodom? He was going east. He was going away from God. In the book of Numbers, chapter 23 and verse 7, we read there that, um, that Balaam, that wicked prophet, Balaam was commissioned by Balak, the king of Moab, it says to come out of the mountains of the east, saying, curse me, Jacob, and come defy Israel. He was from the east, it's the mountains of the east, and he was to curse the people of God. In Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 16, Ezekiel goes into the temple and he finds the temple is destroyed, is uh, defiled rather, because there's 25 men in the temple with their backs towards the temple and their faces towards the east, and they worship the sun towards the east in God's holy temple. Their back is towards God, and their faces is toward the east as they worship the sun. They're away from God. Now, in addition to that, we also have the story of Jonah. When Jonah is in his backslidden state, there he goes out of the city of Nineveh, and he says he sits down on the east side of the city of Nineveh. Why did God bother to tell us it was the east side of Nineveh when, jo uh, when Jonah was in his backslidden condition? Well, obviously, because east is symbolic of going away from God. Then they built the Tower of Babel. It was from the east. Read that in Genesis chapter 11. Now, by the same token, going west is always symbolic of going towards God. Matthew chapter 2, when the wise men came, uh, it says they came from the east to Jerusalem. That means they were going west, as the writer of the Christmas carol put it, westward leading, still proceeding. Guide us to thy perfect light. Um, they came from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born the king of the Jews? They were going towards God. Jesus is God. When they got there, when they found him, what did they do? They worshipped him. You only worship God. They worshiped him. They were going west. They were going towards God. Matthew chapter 2 verse 9, it says, When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them. It's going west. And uh, till it came and stood over where the young child was. It led them to God. They went towards God. Jesus talks about his second coming. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 27, and he says, For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The second coming is going to be 
the Lord Jesus going from east to west. The so lightning comes from the east and shines to the west. Now that explains to us a little bit here about the next passage, Ezekiel chapter 44. It explains to us about the east gate there on the, on the, the east wall there of Jerusalem. Jesus touched at his second coming. He touches down on uh, the Mount of Olives and he comes westward and through into the city of Jerusalem through the east gate, which is sealed up at this particular time, but he's going to unseal it. And so he's coming. Here's, this is the second coming. He's going westward as lightning shineth out of the east and unto the west. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And, so, and it tells us here that he, uh, that the, um, he looks, he, Ezekiel said he looks towards the east, this gate, and it was shut. And then said the Lord unto me, this gate shall be shut. It shall not be opened and no man shall enter in by it. Because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it, therefore it shall be shut. So Jesus used that gate when he was here at his first coming, and he's going to enter Jerusalem by it in the second coming. And no one in between is going to use it. It's all sealed up, which when we get to that, uh, to that gate, we'll have a lot more to say about that. Now in Acts chapter 16, the whole history of the world was changed in Acts chapter 16. We read there that when they had gone through Phrygia, and the regions of Galatia, they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Asia is to the east. They were forbidden to preach the word in Asia. Well, what happens? Well, a vision appears to Paul at midnight, and there's a man from Macedonia that says, come over and help us. Where's Macedonia? Macedonia is to the west. That's in Europe. And this is where the whole history of the world was changed. The gospel left the east and went into the west, the western world. And Europe was evangelized. Ultimately, Europe was evangelized. And so it was a result of this, of this uh, a vision here. And, it's, and uh, the scripture says here, Immediately we, we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord hath called us to preach the gospel unto them. The gospel was taken westward, taken towards God. Now Abraham, Abraham was a lot like us. He's a lot like Christians today. In Genesis 12 and verse 8, we read, He removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel. The east of Bethel. Now, Bethel means the house of God. Where do we find Abraham? We find him east of Bethel. So he's going away from God. But read farther in the verse. It says, And he pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west, He's east of Bethel, so Bethel is on the west, the house of God, and Hai, this is the city of Hai, on the east. Abraham is right in between the two of them. Okay, God is to the west. Hai, which means ruin, is to the east. And there it says, he built an altar unto the Lord. He tried to walk a fine line between the world and God. A lot of Christians are doing that today. Jesus described them as lukewarm. Well, Bethel means the house of God. Hai means ruin. And so here's Abraham walking a fine line in between them. Now, uh, on the uh, uh, next sheet that you have there, there is a chart of the tabernacle in the wilderness. And notice the little compass there down near the bottom. Every night they set up the tabernacle in the, facing the same direction. If you notice there on your chart, the gate of the tabernacle is always facing east. That means that when you go into the tabernacle, you're going west. You're going towards God. When you leave the tabernacle, you're going east. You're going away from God. And the Jews had to Pardon me. <clears throat> they had to set that tabernacle up the same way every, every single time. So, getting back to the western wall. To enter into the city of Jerusalem by these four gates on that western wall, 
meant that you had to you were going east you were going away from god and all four gates speak of damnation that's the penalty for going away from god now we come to the southern wall and the southern wall speaks of separation south of israel is egypt and egypt is a type of the world and so god did not allow them to put any gates on the southern wall because any gate on the southern wall would lead to egypt which symbolizes the world and god does not want his people in the world first john 2 15 through 17 love not the world neither the things that are in the world and if any man love the world the love of the father is not in him for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes the pride of life is not of the father but is of the world and the world passes away with the lust thereof but he that doeth the will of god abideth forever i'd like you to turn back to genesis chapter 12 if you will genesis chapter 12 i want to pick up abraham again here genesis chapter 12 we read in verse 9 Abram journeyed going on still towards the south. He's heading towards Egypt. He's not supposed to go to Egypt, but he's heading towards Egypt. Now that's the first time in the Bible the word south appears. All right, and look at the next verse, verse 10. And there was a famine in the land, and Abraham went down into Egypt. This is the first time the word Egypt appears in the Bible. So you have south in verse 9. You have Egypt in verse 10. And he journeys southward into, um, into uh, Egypt. Now look at chapter 13, verse 1. It says, Abram went up out of Egypt. Good for him. He's coming out of the world. He and his wife and all that he had and lot with him into the south. That is, they were still down south there, but they were coming northward now. They're coming out of, uh, coming out of Egypt. Look at verse 3. And he went on his journeys from the south. Notice from the south, not to the south. From the south, he's heading northward. From the south even to Bethel. Here's Bethel, the house of God unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai. He has met a defeat. He was defeated down in the land of Egypt. We don't have time to, to go into that. And when you meet a defeat in your Christian life, you have to go back to where the defeat took place and get the victory. And this is what Abraham does. He's in that twilight zone between Bethel and Hai, between the house of God and ruin. And he has to go back there, and it says there that that's where he built an altar and he worshiped the Lord. In verse 4, it says, Unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now, one more verse in this chapter, and that's verse 11. It says, then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. So Abraham goes south, Lot was with him, then they go north, and then Lot goes by himself to the east. So these directions in the Bible are all significant. They all have spiritual significance to them. Okay, well, continuing on, 2 Corinthians 6.17 Wherefore, come out from among them. Who's them? That's the world. Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. That's why there's no gates on the southern wall. It says, come out from among them, be separate. 1 Peter 4.4 4. says, wherein they think it strange. Who's they? The world. They think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. It, it, people, uh, the world doesn't like people. They won't run with them and, and uh, do all the things they do. Ephesians 5.11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Remember when Israel was in the wilderness, they got tired of the manna. 
Remember that? They said, oh, we've got us this manna. We're tired of eating this manna. And then they said in Numbers chapter 11, verse 5 and 6, we remember. What do you remember? Well, it turns out they're going to remember their days of slavery in Egypt. We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely. They didn't eat it freely. That was a lie. <laughs> they were slaves. We remember the fish which we did in Egypt, eat in Egypt freely. And the cucumbers, and the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. But our soul is dried away, and there's nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. They fed themselves on the food of Egypt. There's a lot of Christians today feeding themselves on the food of this world. And they wonder why they're not growing in the things of God, why they're not getting stronger spiritually, why they meet defeat in their life. Well, that's the reason. What are you feeding yourself on? So, uh, as we saw here, the first time south and the first time Egypt is used is in, used in connection with Abram going down into Egypt where he had no, he had no uh, business being. Now, if any Jew wanted to leave the city of Jerusalem and go to Egypt, remember there's, there's no wall there to the south, he had to do one of two things. He either had to go out the dung gate, which is on the western wall, and to do that, to get to, to Egypt, he had to trample through all the filth, all the garbage, all the trash, where all the, the dung was, was dumped the, all the anim, from the animals. He had to walk through all that to get down to Egypt. Filthy, filthy uh, existence. Or he could go on the other side to the eastern wall, and he could go out there on, on the uh, the water or the uh, fountain, fountain gate and water gate were on the the east side there, um, and he could uh, he could do that. But if he did that, he would have to turn his back on the word of God because the water gate and the fountain gate symbolize the word of God, and he would have to turn his back on the word of God to go down to Egypt. So God put no gate in that southern wall. Now, um, there, so the southern wall, there, there's no, no exit to Egypt at all. When Abraham went down south to Egypt, he went, but he came back. Isaac did the same thing. He came back. And then Jacob went down there, and he didn't come back. He brought, instead brought his whole family down there. And there they dwelt in Egypt. And it wound up 400 years of slavery for that act of disobedience. 400 years of, of slavery. So, and there was no exit from the promised land into Egypt. Now that brings us to the Eastern Wall. And the Eastern Wall has five gates. And these, uh, the first two gates speak to, uh, the first two gates, yes, speak to us of inspiration, the Word of God. And the upper gates refer to us as coronation, the, the coronation of the Lord Jesus Christ. So first of all, these lower gates that speak of inspiration, both of them uh, symbolize the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And 2 Peter 1.21 tells us, Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Well, both these gates, water gate and fountain gate, together they symbolize the Word of God. The fountain gate speaks to us of inspiration. And the water gate speaks to us of preservation. Inspiration is no good without preservation. God gave us his inspired word, but he didn't leave it up to us to keep it. He has supernaturally preserved his word unto all generations, as he promised, John, uh, uh, Psalms 12, 7 says. And so... The fountain gate is inspiration. The, the um, water gate is the preservation of the Word of God. Now you say, why or how does this symbolize the Word of God? Well, 
in the Bible, water is symbolic of the Word of God. Notice in your notes, Ephesians 5, 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word. There's the water, there's the Word, the washing of water by the Word of God. John 15, 3, Jesus said, Now ye are clean, how are we clean? Through the Word which I have spoken unto you. The Word of God, it's a cleanser. Psalm 119, verse 9, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. That's how we're cleansed, by the word of God. Now I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Nehemiah, that third chapter of the book of Nehemiah. Uh, we want, to, want you to see something of special importance here in Nehemiah chapter 3. This is the chapter where he lists 10 of the 12 gates. And I want you to see something very special in connection with these two gates, the, the fountain gate and the water gate. In verse 1, we have here the sheep gate. Notice what it says. It says they built or builded the sheep gate. So that first gate they built. Then we go to verse 2. It says, but the fish gate did the sons of Hassaniah build. So they built the second gate. Then verse 6, moreover the old gate repaired Jehodiah. Well, the old gate had been there before, and they didn't build it, they repaired it. Okay. So the first three gates, two were built, one was repaired. Then we go down to verse 13, the valley gate. And what happened to the valley gate? It had to be repaired. Then we go down to verse 14, the dung gate. Look at there. It had to be repaired also. Then we come to verse 15, the gate of the fountain. It had to be repaired. Okay, so all of these gates either had to be built or repaired. Now drop down to verse 26. It says, Moreover, the Nethamims dwelt in Ophel unto the place against the water gate towards the east and the tower that lieth out. The water gate, it was neither built nor repaired. Why not? It symbolizes the Word of God, and the Word of God needs no repairing. You don't have to repair the Word of God. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. The Word of God is perfect. God said He will preserve it unto all generations. We have the perfect revelation of God in the Holy Scriptures. It doesn't need any correcting, any fixing, any healing, nothing like that. And thank God for that. We have God's complete word. And that, ex that extends even to translations. We don't, most of us here, in fact, I doubt any of us here can read Greek or Hebrew. But we can read English. And God has translated the, uh, his word into English. And he's translated it into French. And he's translated it into Dutch and German. And, and uh, all the, the, most of all the languages of the world, they have the word of God. And even though it's a translation, it is perfect. It doesn't need fixing. All right. So that's the lower, the two gates on the lower side. They speak of inspiration. And then we have the upper gates, three of them there. There is the horse gate, and then there is the golden gate, east gate, golden gate, and there is the corner gate. And all three of these gates are symbolic of Jesus' second coming, his coronation. Bottom two gates, inspiration. Upper three gates, coronation. This is where Jesus comes back, as it says in Revelation 19, 16, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. As Paul writes in 1 Timothy 6, 15, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings, and the Lord of Lords. So when you enter the city of Jerusalem from those five gates on the eastern wall, that means you are going west. You're going towards God. Inside that wall, up in the northeast part, sat the temple in Jerusalem. And this was the house of God. You go westward through those 
eastern gates and you come right there. There it is, right behind the walls, right behind the north wall, right behind the eastern wall is the house of God. You're going towards God. Now, as we study these gates in the chronological, chronological order, going counterclockwise, it presents a picture of God's plan for the ages. It begins with Jesus, the Lamb, who was slain from the foundation of the world. That's the first gate, the sheep gate. And extends unto Jesus and his coming as King of kings and Lord of lords. That climaxes with the corner gate. That's the full circle around the city of Jerusalem. And as we said, saw in 1 Timothy 6.15, he is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now a study of the gates of Jerusalem is a study of number one, Bible history. Secondly, it's a study of Bible prophecy. And thirdly, it is a study of Bible redemption. So we're going to be in the ensuing weeks, the weeks that are to follow, we're going to be looking at these gates in their chronological order and seeing God's prophetic program from the ages, from the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world until the second coming of Jesus as he comes back as King of kings and Lord of lords. I hope you'll be with us. Let's look to God in prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this time together in the Word. Thank you, Lord, for these gates. What a message they contain for us. Thank you, Lord, for tucking away in the Scripture these little nuggets of truth, this, this, these precious revelations of yourself. And Lord, help us to feed upon them and chew upon them and, and digest them and grow in grace in the knowledge of thee. Dismiss us with your blessing now. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.